Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. We're here at the University of Arizona College of Medicine, and I want to send a special thank you to Dr. Guy Reed, Dean of the Medical School, for hosting us. Joining me today, our Director of the Arizona Department of Health Services, Dr. Kara Christ, Steve Purvis, President and CEO of ValleyWise Health, and Annabelle Castro Thompson, Senior Vice President of Health Equity at Equality Health. We're also joined by Major General Mick McGuire, Jamie Snyder, Director of Access, Dr. Guy Reed, Dean of the University of Arizona College of Medicine, Dr. Jody Carter, Chief Clinical Integration Officer at Phoenix Children's Hospital, Dr. Ross Goldberg, President of the Arizona Medical Association, Robin Schaefer, Executive Director of the Arizona Nurses Association, Kelly Fine, CEO of the Arizona Pharmacy Association, and Lori Walmsley, Director of Pharmacy Affairs at Walgreens. I want to say thank you to all of these folks for taking time out of your day and week to, to join us here. Today we have a very important announcement. Flu season is just around the corner and Arizona isn't taking any chances. We've always taken the flu seriously, but the overlap with COVID-19 this year presents greater challenges than the typical flu season. With public health and healthcare resources already focused on responding to COVID-19, preventing the flu is more important than ever. To give you some perspective, every year in Arizona, on average, five to 20% of the population gets hit with the flu. More than 4,000 people are hospitalized in Arizona with flu complications. And tragically, in our state, about 700 people die from the flu each year. But we are not defenseless in this fight. Health experts will tell you the single best way to prevent the flu is to get a flu shot. Doing so can reduce the intensity of symptoms and the need for hospitalization for those who do contract the flu. To prepare for the upcoming flu season and expand access to the influenza vaccination, Arizona is going to have an aggressive plan of action. Here's what you can expect. First, our Department of Health Services is working to significantly expand the number of influenza vaccines available to the uninsured and underinsured in Arizona. Arizonans who lack health insurance will be able to receive one of these shots at your health care provider's office, pharmacies, community health centers, and facilities run by your local health department. I want to thank Dr. Kara Christ and the many health professionals from around the state for taking on this effort in addition to all they've done to contain the coronavirus. Next, we're gonna be making it easier for Arizonans insured by the state's Medicaid agency, Access, to get their flu shot. Access will be increasing reimbursements to providers that offer flu shots to Access members. In addition, certified pharmacists will now be able to administer the influenza vaccine to access enrolled children. And this year, access members who get their flu shot will receive a $10 gift card. These actions have led to a 50% increase in flu shot administration rates in other states, and we're confident that they'll make a big difference in Arizona as well. I want to thank Access Director Jamie Snyder and her team for their leadership and partnership in making these resources available to Access members and for the tremendous work being done at Access over the past several months. Next, with the help of Arizona's healthcare providers and pharmacies, we are expanding flu shots to certain COVID-19 testing sites throughout the state. It's simple. As early as next month, when you stop by certain sites for a COVID-19 test, 
you'll be able to get a flu shot as well. To that end, my thanks go out to the community-based pharmacies that have stepped up and worked extra hard and lended an extra hand uh, this flu season, and the many health care providers partnering in this effort across Arizona. Finally, this flu season, Arizona will offer a bevy of on online tools, including a vaccine finder and business toolkit. The toolkit will provide information and resources, including to help businesses set up their own flu vaccine clinics on site. These resources and more will be rolling out in the coming days. As you can see by the people standing here, the experts agree it's never been more important to get your flu shot. We're going to be working with them to spread the word. But I want to emphasize that Arizona's most important partner in this fight is you, the people of Arizona. You've made a big difference in where we are today, and you can make a huge difference in where we'll be tomorrow going forward. We've been able to make a significant amount of progress in the fight against COVID-19. We can't let up now. We know many of the same prevention measures that work for COVID-19 will also work for influenza. So please continue doing the things we know that work, the fundamentals. Mask up, wash your hands frequently. Don't touch your face, nose, mouth, or eyes. Stay physically distant. If you don't feel well, please stay home. And of course, boost your immune system by rolling up your sleeve and getting a flu shot. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Kara Christ for more information. Dr. Christ. Thank you, Governor. So as everyone knows, ADHS has been working nonstop since January in response to the COVID-19 pandemic to ensure we keep our communities and families safe. However, like every year, we're also working to prepare for the upcoming flu season and taking proactive steps to preserve our hospital resources. Every year, our hospital capacity becomes challenged during influenza season, very similar to the impacts that we saw with the peaks of COVID-19 this summer. With this upcoming flu season and with COVID-19 still circulating in our communities, there's a potential that our healthcare system could become overwhelmed. That's why it's critical for all of us to take proactive steps to prevent the spread of both diseases. Just as everyone has a role in the stopping of spread of COVID-19, we all need to work together to slow the spread of influenza. There are simple steps that everyone can take. Maintaining physical distancing, washing your hands, wearing a mask and staying home when you are sick, all of that can help spread the slow of both diseases. But fortunately, there's an additional step that we can take for this, to slow the spread of influenza, which is getting vaccinated. As a public health professional and as a physician and a mom, influenza is one of those things that scares me the most. It can spread quickly, it can cause complications, and in some cases it can be fatal. I don't know if you remember last year, but we had our highest number of flu cases recorded. Over 36,000 cases of influenza were reported to public health, and we know not everyone was searching for an influenza test. Our syndromic surveillance shows that last year at the peak, about 10% of hospital visits were due to influenza. And while there's no vaccine for COVID-19 yet, we do have a vaccine for influenza, and we recommend that everybody get it right away. It decreases the severity of symptoms, shortens the duration that you can spread it to others, and it also reduces the risk of hospitalization and death. It's not too early to get your flu shot, and vaccine is currently available in our community. I'd also like to provide an update today on Arizona's gradual reopening. A few weeks ago, ADHS released benchmarks for a phased reopening for businesses that were paused under Executive Orders 2020-43 and 52. These benchmarks include metrics for COVID-19 cases, community transmission, and hospital status. This week, nine counties are in categories that allow for certain businesses to reopen with reduced occupancy and strict public health requirements. 
There are eight counties in the moderate category, including Pima County and Maricopa, and there's one in the minimal category, which is Greenlee. Looking ahead at our data, it's possible that additional counties could move into the moderate category this week when our dashboard updates. Since announcing that several new counties met those benchmarks, 1,205 gyms, bars providing dine-in services, water parks, and movie theaters filed attestations agreeing to open with a reduced occupancy and to comply with the prevention requirements for their establishment type. These requirements include limiting the occupancy, requiring the use of masks except when eating or drinking, enforcing physical distancing of at least six feet, increasing their cleaning and disinfecting practices, and screening staff for symptoms prior to the start of their shift. There's also industry-specific requirements that each group must follow. For those businesses to remain open, compliance with public health requirements is critical. This will allow us to continue reducing the spread and reopen our businesses. We have had many businesses open successfully and identify best practices for implementing the requirements. However, we have also received complaints regarding businesses that are not complying with the requirements, in addition to surveillance by public health professionals and law enforcement. Over the weekend, we identified three bars providing dine-in services that were not complying with these requirements. These bars were closed by the department and have lost their liquor licenses indefinitely. All businesses must do their part to mitigate the spread of COVID-19 or they will be held accountable. ADHS and our partners are taking this very seriously. We'll continue to investigate complaints and respond with enforcement. But this is where we need everybody's help. If you see a business that is not following the requirements, please submit a complaint online at azhealth.gov slash compliance COVID-19, or you can call our COVID-19 compliance hotline. And for schools, we all know the critical importance to get our children back in the classroom, but we wanna make sure that we're doing it safely for our students, their families, and their teachers. Working collaboratively with Superintendent of Public Instruction, Kathy Hoffman, and her team at the Department of Education, a roadmap for reopening schools and benchmarks were developed to return to safe in-person instruction. Currently, four counties have met the benchmarks to return to the classroom, and many schools have made the decision to return to a hybrid learning model. And based on a forward look at our data, we anticipate that additional counties will move into moderate category and allow them to move into hybrid learning. Schools are required to post their mitigation plans on their websites, and that's for parents to review the mitigation plans so that they can determine if they want to send their children back to school. It's a decision that each family needs to make based on the risk to their students and their household loved ones. I would encourage parents to review these plans and determine the best method for their families. In addition to reporting outbreaks to their local public health departments, schools must notify their students parents, guardians, and staff about any outbreaks of COVID-19 at their school. They must also provide their parents with the actions that they have taken to keep their students and staff safe. Last week, Superintendent Hoffman and I sent a joint letter to, letter, er, to schools reminding them of the importance of wearing masks in reducing the spread of COVID-19, and that mask use is required by Executive Order 2020-51. We want everyone who has, who needs a face mask to have access to that. So we have partnered with Hanes to provide five free face masks to students and their families. So families and schools can go to azhealth.gov slash order masks to get free masks shipped to their home. We're asking everyone at this time to get your influenza shot. Many private healthcare providers and pharmacies are already offering it. So we encourage you to get vaccinated as soon as possible. Our typical flu season runs October to March with a peak of cases around February. But as we always say, influenza is predictably unpredictable. So the sooner you can get vaccinated, the better. And we ask everyone to routinely implement infection prevention practices that will stop the spread of both COVID and influenza. And if you believe that a business isn't following the public health requirements, which were established for the safety of customers, employees, and the public, we encourage you to share your concerns so local and state officials can follow up. And as a reminder, this upcoming weekend is Labor Day. We ask that all Arizonas, Arizonans remember 
that you are safer at home. If you get together with others outside your household, please keep gathering small, wear masks and physically distance and try to stay outdoors. Stay safe this holiday weekend. And finally, as we approach influenza season, please stay home when you're sick. I'd now like to introduce Steve Purvis, the CEO of Valleywise Hospital. Um, they have been an invaluable partner and provide care to some of our most vulnerable Arizonans. Steve. <clears throat> Hello, I'm Steve Purvis. I'm President and CEO of Valleywise Health. I'm delighted to be here today. Um, it's an honor to be here with Governor Ducey and also with Dr. Christ. Um, and I want to uh, express appreciation for this important message uh, that we're sharing with you today um, from uh, our perspective here at Valley Wise Health uh, and also our thanks to the governor for the leadership um, you know, for this message that I think is going to help. So it's very heartening uh, to hear the plans uh, that the governor has announced uh, and Dr. Christ um, they've marshaled resources to be able to bring this uh, forward uh, to really address the health and well-being uh, of Arizonans uh, this season. I'm here to give a, a very, very simple message today to the people of Arizona who want to support our incredible health care workforce uh, at Valley Wise Health and at all hospitals across our state. And that is to please get a flu shot. Um, if you do, you're much like, less likely uh, to end up in one of our hospitals. You're much less likely to end up in one of our ICUs. And you're much less likely to have to be ventilated. Uh, so these are simple things that you can do uh, to, to significantly reduce the likelihood that you will end up there. Every year, we have hundreds of admissions for flu, our emergency departments are clogged with patients with flu-like symptoms, uh, illnesses, and complications. The CDC estimates that influenza was associated with over 490,000 hospitalizations nationwide during 2018-2019 influenza season. So please, if you do want to support the state's healthcare heroes, and they are truly heroes, uh, who are on the front lines of patient care every single day, please get the flu shot. Please make sure your loved ones and friends also get the flu shot. We're grateful for the hard work of our healthcare professionals, our first responders, our entire communities, and local leaders. Uh, they put in a lot uh, to help keep our citizens healthy already. Please help us keep up this momentum by taking the flu seriously and getting a flu shot Continue with the everyday measures that we tell people to do every year. Covering your cough, staying home when you're sick, washing your hands. These are tried and true procedures, not very exciting, but really important ways that you can prevent the spread of these respiratory illnesses. We're all in this together, and I thank Governor Ducey and Dr. Chris for their teams of experts for being such great partners here and in helping us to keep Arizona going in the right direction. Thanks much. Thank you, Governor Ducey, for the uh, opportunity to attend here and to the leadership present. Muchas gracias, Gobernador Ducey, por la invitación para asistir y participar en el lanzamiento de la iniciativa de vacunación en contra de la influenza o gripe estacional. Mi nombre es Anabel Castro Thompson y yo soy vicepresidenta de Igualdad en Acceso a la Salud de Equality Health. También soy nurse practitioner y expresidenta de la Asociación Nacional de Enfermeras Hispanas. Equality Health es un sistema integral de salud que cuenta con una red de aproximadamente 4,500 proveedores de salud y cuyo objetivo es mejorar el acceso de la atención médica de alta calidad para las personas que durante mucho tiempo han luchado para navegar el sistema de salud tradicional de los Estados Unidos. Nuestra misión es garantizar que todas las personas reciban una atención médica integral de alta calidad y que aumente y mejore sus vidas. Como saben, 
La temporada de influenza en Arizona inicia en octubre y se extiende hasta el mes de marzo. Y cada año la, grupa, la gripe estacional, o sea el flu, enferma a millones de personas en los Estados Unidos, afectando mayormente a adultos mayores, a niños pequeños, a mujeres embarazadas y a personas con ciertos problemas crónicos que tienen mayor riesgo de sufrir complicaciones graves por la enfermedad, incluida la muerte. Es por eso que al recibir la vacuna del flu, usted se está protegiendo a sí mismo, pero protege también a la gente que lo rodea y a la gente que usted ama. Quizás algunas personas puedan preguntarse, ¿Por qué debería vacunarme contra la influenza? La respuesta es precisa y es concreta. Con la presencia del COVID-19 eh, en nuestra comunidad, es probable que el virus del flu y el COVID-19 coincidan durante este otoño. Es por esta razón, hoy más que nunca, que la vacunación contra la influenza es de vital importancia para proteger a nuestra comunidad, a nuestros ancianos y a las personas vulnerables por sus condiciones de salud. La vacuna contra la influenza puede evitar que usted se enferme de la gripe, además de millones de consultas médicas por padecimientos relacionados con esta enfermedad. La vacuna contra el flu puede reducir el riesgo de hospitalizaciones debido a las complicaciones de la enfermedad en infantes, adultos de edad laboral y adultos mayores, ancianos. La vacuna contra la influenza es una importante herramienta preventiva para personas que sufren de enfermedades crónicas. Y por último, la vacuna contra la influenza Ayuda a proteger a las mujeres durante y después del embarazo y puede además salvar la vida de sus niños. Me gustaría destacar que esta iniciativa en la que estamos presentes hoy en día también puede promover nuestro trabajo colectivo para abordar las desigualdades en el acceso de los servicios de salud en, pobl en poblaciones vulnerables y diversas. Es tiempo de trabajar para proteger a nuestros abuelos, proteger a nuestros trabajadores de salud y a todo aquel individuo afectado por padecimientos crónicos. Y esto empieza con ponernos todos la vacuna. Juntos podemos y debemos fortalecer la salud de individuos y de comunidades enteras. Muchas gracias. Muchas gracias, Annabelle. Thank you very much. Thank you as well, Dr. Christ and Steve Purvis and uh, to all the other subject matter experts that have joined us today. Let me close by once again saying thank you to every Arizonan for doing your part this flu season and getting a flu shot. And with that, let's open it up to some questions. So right now we don't um, recommend multiple doses. There are some um, higher dose immunizations that um, those that are older or in a high risk population can get. But if you get your flu shot now, it will last through the entire season. Director, actually my question is for you, nothing personal, Governor. Uh, two, two questions, one, one is technical. Uh, I heard the, the, the comments about people being able to get free shots at certain places. Is that just the shot that's free or will the, they still be charged by their doctor, their pharmacist or whatever? I mean, or is the whole thing free? It's gonna depend on what your insurance plan and where you go, but you can find fully free shots 
um, available, and we will have that on our vaccine finder. I thought this was for uninsured and underinsured. So, so it is. So if you go to your, the, the thing may be if you're going for part of a um, like office visit, you might have a copay that would be associated with the office visit. The vaccine is free through the vaccines for children. So it depends on the specific circumstance on whether or not you would have to pay. But we do try to make sure that there are no barriers to vaccination, um, especially for those that are uninsured or underinsured. Okay. The other question is, uh, I've seen all those wonderful commercials of you looking at the camera talking about masks. Uh, I heard you talk again about masks today, but we're spending this $3 million. How does that get undermined by having pictures of the governor on national television without a mask? Haven't we just blown all that good PR? I think we've done a really good job about getting the message out um, on the importance of mask wearing. There are circumstances where it may be safe to not do that, um, but we would encourage everyone to wear a mask. Do you think it was safe? Do you, do you, no, seriously, do you think it was safe? He was governor. You were in a group with a whole bunch of other people not socially. I, I want people to wear a mask. I've been consistent on this. People can exercise their First Amendment rights whether it's a protest or a political event, which is what I was at, was a political event, which happened to be outdoors. When I'm indoors, I wear a mask. When I'm in a business, when I'm in a grocery store, when I'm in the office, where I'm anywhere inside that I can't socially distance or it's mandated, I'm wearing a mask. But you're the only one here not wearing one. I'm, well, the reason I don't have a mask on right now, Howie, is that I've heard from the deaf community that in addition to our skilled sign uh, folks, that they sometimes read lips. So uh, as a courtesy to them, while I'm answering questions, I'm going to have the mask off, then I'm going to put it on, and I'll, I'll, I'll exit. Thank you. Hi, Governor. Over here, Tony with Telemundo. So I'm not sure if this question is better for you or Dr. Chris, but um, my question is about the undocumented community. I know the goal here is to make these flu shots available for everybody, but I feel like sometimes families that uh, don't have a legal status, it makes it a bit more challenging, a lot more money out of their pocket. Um, is there a plan for undocumented families and maybe easier access to these flu shots? We, we want everybody to get a flu shot. And, and, and anybody can contract the flu, anyone can spread the flu. Uh, so part of the way the, the program works is to take into account that there are folks that are underinsured, uninsured, uh, and in different situations. We want to encourage flu shots. Do we have an idea maybe of like cost or, I, I don't know, just maybe a bit more help as to um, maybe helping us provide more answers on how families who don't have a lot of resources can better get access to these. Products. So I'm going to let Dr. Christ handle some of the details, and it will all be spelled out on the website, but it's uh, that, that the cost uh, should not be a barrier, uh, that people that, that want a flu shot uh, will have access to that depending on their circumstances. But uh, the, the lack of, of finances w will not be the issue in not being able to get a flu shot. Oh, yeah. So, so absolutely. Um, when, when you're looking for a, an influenza shot or any of your childhood immunizations, public health is always a great place to look because they will either partner with mass immunizers or offer vaccination clinics that will be free. Um, that will be on our website, but I'd like to turn it over to Annabelle, too. Sure, um, absolutely. Um, as, as many of you know, Equality Health has been undertaking a large collaborations out in the community to make sure that we engage diverse and vulnerable populations, specifically the Latino community. And so we will be undertaking those types of efforts with many here uh, in this platform. Definitivamente estamos comprometidos a que el acceso de salud sea a todas las comunidades incluyendo comunidades diversas, comunidades vulnerables, la gente de bajos recursos, la gente indocumentada, y Quality Health estará eh, eh, haciendo esfuerzos en la comunidad para asegurar que todo esto está accesible a nuestras comunidades. Entonces habrán esfuerzos, pero ahorita no hay información específica. No hay información específica en los detalles, más sin embargo, este, las pláticas, las juntas, el esfuerzo se están concretando. 
Governor, I'm not sure who wants to address this question, but the American Academy of Pediatrics uh, comes out with surveys comparing the number of children and teenagers across the country who have contracted coronavirus. Their latest uh, survey came out 10 days ago, and according to it, Arizona has the highest per capita, 1,300 for every 100,000 children and teenagers in Arizona have contracted coronavirus. The national average is 583 per 100,000. Do we have any idea why our numbers are so high? Well, in terms of one, uh, our COVID-19 numbers right now really are trending in, in a positive ter direction from p positivity to COVID-like illness indication to hospital beds to our state has the lowest r not uh, in the country. We have seen that the overwhelming majority of contraction for COVID-19 has been in the demographic 20 to, to 44 uh, age. Uh, I, I don't know, I'll let Dr. Christ add, add on to this. Uh, I think in my conversations with, with other governors, that's what they've seen a, as well. There's, uh, th there's likely a number of, of reasons for it. Uh, the, the good news is w while there are still anomalies and uh, everyone has to be really careful with this virus, which is dangerous and unpredictable, uh, they are in the category of, unless they have an underlying health condition where uh, they, they rebound pretty quickly. Dr. Chris, do you, do you have any, I mean, it's like, um, you know, it's double the national average. Yes, and I think that that's a tribute to how much testing we are able to do in Arizona. So they are testing proportionately to the number of tests that are being done for that age group. So we are testing a lot of kids. We also saw an increase recently because we've um, partnered with our school districts to try and get more testing of our families and their students. But if you look at our test numbers, um, it, it is proportionate to the number of tests that we're doing. Our children aren't, high, aren't more impacted than than how many were testing. And the second part of their survey showed that Arizona had a 4.1% hospitalization rate among children and teenagers, which among the states that broke down the, the numbers, that was the highest in the country. So it can't just be that we're testing more because it seems like more of our kids are getting seriously ill. It also has to do with how much of the data we're reporting. So we are putting out um, hospitalization by age category and we are matching with the um, with Health Current, the HIE, to try and get as complete data as we can. So we're not seeing a lot of differences between what we're seeing in Arizona and other states when we talk to the states. It just has to do with the, the types and the amount of data we're collecting. Thank you. Hi, Governor. Uh, what is the long-term plan for COVID-19? There was an informal long-term planning group that has been removed. Is the long-term plan wear a mask, social distance, get a flu shot, or is there a roadmap that you are following that the public can see? Like what happens if a county goes from moderate to substantial? Where's the roadmap? So the, there's, there's a long-term planning uh, around schools, around the targeted businesses that, like I said, we've unhappily but responsibly have had to address in, in a targeted fashion from our, our restaurants, our bars, our nightclubs, and, and our gyms. You can go on the ArizonaHealth.gov site and see each of, of these plans in detail and where they are. You're right, our numbers are going in the right direction right now. In terms of the long-term plan nationally, of course, is the Operation Warp Speed at the federal level is uh, after that vaccine. Uh, in the interim, what we want to do is prioritize public health and safety and what components of our economy that we can protect in terms of allowing livelihoods to happen safely along with children going back to school are all things that we want to address. So it, it's different depending on the industry, but each of the plans contemplate what the, the, the future could bring. It is unpredictable. Part of the reason we're spending so much time and all these good people came out today, and again, thank you, is the big concern for the fall is flu season. 
and how that could complicate COVID-19. So the best thing people can do that are watching right now is to get that flu shot and then continue the, the fundamentals that they've, they've done so well to date. Uh, there still appears to be a lot of secrecy around releasing of positive cases by locations. Now we can't find out which schools publicly have outbreaks. ADHS continues to say there is a privacy issue when in fact there are no names of individuals that anyone is requesting. Are you hiding this information? We're, we're, not, we're not hiding anything. According to Johns Hopkins, Arizona has an A plus in terms of its data that's been put out there. I'd ask anybody that wants to know more to go to azhealth.gov and look at the data dashboard, which has all the specific information. In terms of schools, that information will be available by county, of course. It will also be available to the parents, the guardians, the teachers, the principals, and the staff of the schools. But along There's with no the school, secret there. But, but along with the schools, universities are not publicly uh, saying as well where some of their outbreaks are. Are you satisfy, satisfied with the university's response like ASU's management around their release of numbers? I want to really uh, applaud Dr. Michael Crow. Dr. Bobby Robbins, Dr. Rita Chang, what they've contemplated, the plans that they've put in place, some of the innovative techniques, not only around testing, uh, but also of getting ahead of this before an outbreak happens. And uh, I, I, it was in our discussion this morning, I can't remember if they were crediting ASU or U of A, but somebody uh, discovered uh, a, a positive test through the wastewater, was able to proactively test that resident or, or, or dorm and, and avoid uh, further spread. It so these are all things that our research and developers and leadership at the university level is happening in Arizona and, uh, and we're very supportive of them. Hi, Governor. My name is Nayella Charles. I'm with 12 News. You expressed that you want to get ahead of this. Dr. Chris mentioned that one of her main concerns is hospital capacity, which at this point, according to DHS, 23 percent of ICU beds are available. So do you think with flu season on its way, is it the right time to open up more businesses and schools? Well, the, the first thing I want to say in terms of Arizona's hospital capacity, both at the hospital level and the ICU level, it's as low as it's been since mid-May before we had any, any of the issues that we went through in late June and, and early July. So our decisions on when you say reopening, these are, are very incremental decisions with, with guidance and, uh, and, and guidelines that do not take the economy from zero to 100 percent. They're doing it by limiting capacity, um, having these, these fundamentals that need to be uh, adhered to inside these different facilities. So we want to do our best, of course, to prioritize public health and, and safety, but where we can do it responsibly and incrementally, we do want to allow people to, of course, reopen. We want it to be done safely. So our numbers right now are within the guidance that was put out in a bipartisan way, uh, advised by the public health experts, and we're going to continue to follow that. Does that mean you are prepared to readjust if that capacity, uh, if it gets, if there's more people who are becoming hospitalized? We're going to do whatever it takes to protect public health. I think we've demonstrated that over the last several months. Okay. The, the, you know, the, the thing that I would prefer is we've learned so much more about this pandemic and we have so much more knowledge and at least today if we follow these fundamentals and we're responsible and follow the guidelines going forward we have some optimism that it's possible that we wouldn't need to do that but I I think it gets more difficult it's just human nature when you see the numbers trending lower and it's maybe not leading the nightly news ev every night um, and I'm glad that Arizona is in a position right now where we've got the lowest R naught in the country and that means that the the virus is dissipating faster here but it doesn't mean it's behind us it means we don't know what's next so that idea of, of staying vigilant and not letting our guard down is important and, and like i said that's something arizonans have been terrific in doing and i'm very grateful afternoon governor 
I wanted to ask you about like school reopenings. A lot of parents out there have a lot of questions for us about that. Right now, it appears that four counties across the state have met those metrics where they could possibly open re reopen. It's up, it's up to them. Maybe two more counties are expected later this week. However, at the same time, it looks like, too, that more and more bars are applying to reopen. Are you at all concerned that opening these bars could be putting schools at risk? Because we do know that gatherings at bars can be super spreading type events. So if you look at the guidance, first, everything that we're doing in terms of decisions is, is cautious and methodical and incremental, gradual and, and targeted. Uh, in terms of the guidance uh, in, in the reopening of some of these establishments, you are going to be sitting down, you're going to be eating, you're going to, they have mask mandates when you come in. Uh, when you're not eating or drinking, you're going to be wearing masks. So it's more of a conversion type situation from what the establishment was to this idea of, of a, a dine-in option. And we're following the numbers, Dennis, every day and, and every hour. We can we can make adjustments. It's a it's a limited capacity in all of these settings, and we've been at 50 percent capacity inside our dine-in restaurants for for months now, and we've had these ever improving numbers eight consecutive weeks in a row. So we're going to apply that knowledge uh, to the decisions we make in in the future, and like I said, it will be gradual. What, what kind of, what, 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 I just want to ask though too, I mean, but what kind of, you know, staff resources are you going to be, you know, policing this? We know there are bad actors. You've just shot, uh, shut down some restaurants here or bars recently. And, you know, again, like what kind of resources are you going to throw at this? And if, you know, and if, again, well, you feel like oh, reopening, these could threaten you know, school reopening. Well, because the, the first thing I'd like to say is if people will follow the guidance things will, will go much better. We want you to be able to operate safely. That's, that's our objective in doing this. You heard Dr. Chris talk about what the Department of Health Services is doing. Of course, the Department of Liquor, and we've got local enforcement as, as well. This is, this is our, our top priority is the public health and safety of Arizonans. Hello, Governor. Uh at last check last week, I believe the DES backlog was something around 30,000 cases that still needed adjudication. And it's my understanding that there were around 450 people hired to adjudicate these cases at about 8 to 10 a day. Quick back of the napkin math would indicate that that backlog should be cleared by now. Is it? And if it's not, why not? Well, I, I want to say the people at DES have been working overtime. Uh, I was briefed on the uh, amount of funds that we've had distributed. Uh, I think it's been upwards of $8.5 billion to 1.1 million Arizonans. What was slowing the, the disbursement of dollars was an issue around fraud. Now, that has been resolved to everything that was on their plate. In terms of the backlog, uh, that didn't come up in the briefing. That doesn't mean it's been cured, but let me get the details and get back to you. Uh, and actually, my next question is for Dr. Chris. Uh, I, I wanted a little more info on um, some of these bars that were told to shut down. Uh, did, these, did this come from hotline tips? Did it come from independent enforcement? Uh, how did, I guess, how did you know these, guys, these bad actors were being bad actors? So it was a combination of law enforcement notifying us as well as us receiving um, complaints through the, the complaint online list and it was for not socially distancing for dancing that is prohibited under the um, requirements that dot bars with dine-in providing dine-in services follow it also was for not remaining seated at at tables so there were a significant number of infractions and one of them was not serving food and do you have a ballpark of how many complaints you've gotten i mean is this are, are they are they are, i guess are some of them just nuisance complaints at this point or are they are, are they all valid so we've been reviewing about, um, I think we've received about 800 complaints. Um, about 25% of those were not valid and another 25% were um, not about establishments that were covered under the executive order. Um, but we are reviewing them and going out as we see high risk, high priority complaints come in. Thank you. Thank you, good afternoon. So in the past, you have said there's a second spike coming. I think when I say you, the governor, of course, and Dr. Chris, whoever wants to answer this question, a second spike is coming. 
Do you think even with gradual reopening that a second spike is still on the way in September and October? So uh, we don't know, okay? But we're gonna prepare as if it is. I mean, that's the reason we're talking about wearing a mask and socially distancing, and that's why we're being incremental on some of the decisions in reopening targeted businesses with, with guidelines that they, they need to, to follow. Nobody knows what the fall holds. We do know that it will be flu season. We know that that's a complication in and of itself. I'm gonna let the subject matter expert, Dr. Christ, talk about what her team is, is telling her. And I know she's also coordinating with the White House Coronavirus Task Force, but we just spent uh, over an hour and a half uh, on the phone with uh, Vice President Pence and Dr. Anthony Fauci and Dr. Deborah Burks going through where we are today uh, as a state. And these were all the governors from across the country that were on and what needs to be prepared for uh, coming up in, in the fall. Our August and September are typically a little bit different than, than the rest of, of the countries, but we still need to prepare for it because it's still gonna be flu season. Dr. Christ. I, I would agree with Governor Ducey. I don't know that we know what the future holds. I think we are anticipating that we will see additional cases. The benchmarks that we've put into place, though, allow for flexibility. So if a county remains in, uh, goes up to a higher level for two or more weeks, we are going to start working with those establishments to, to bring them back into requirements for that specific benchmark. So we have things built in place. And in addition, if Arizonans keep doing what they're doing so well right now with wearing masks, physically distancing, and getting their flu shot, that will help um, stop a lot of the spread. So, so in closing, I want to say again, thank you to Arizonans for the good job that you are doing. The data shows the improvement that we have in the state. And there's one additional ask that I have today, in addition to wearing a mask, washing your hands, physically distancing, staying home when you're sick, and that is to get a flu shot. So if you'll get a flu shot, you can go to azhealth.gov to see all the details. We don't want cost to be something that gets in the way of this. If you're underinsured or uninsured, we want you to get a flu shot. And it's the best thing you can do to, to add more help to our situation in Arizona and to keep us safe going forward. Thanks very much. Governor, before you leave